Hello everyone, this is Professor Hoffman at MJC, and uh, this is the first lecture of the History 101 uh, series. And in this lecture, we're going to be talking about um, religious toleration and whether or not it actually existed in colonial America. Now, before we begin, uh, just a couple of things that uh, I'd like to uh, bring up here. So, two well-known historical myths about Christopher Columbus, to kind of talk about this idea of toleration and history that we'll be talking about in this lecture are that he discovered America and that he proved the earth was round rather than flat. Now, of course, in reality, educated people had for centuries believed the world was round, and a great deal of what we think we know of and believe about American history is just as wrong as these myths about Columbus. Now, in this course, we will identify some of those myths and examine and how and why they arose. Now, um, before we do this, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some, some myths and realities of historical study. Now, these lectures are devoted to identifying myths of American history and also learning what historians uh, now say about the true course of events in our past. Um, and in the process of this exploration, we'll also challenge popular misconceptions about the study of history itself. And let me just hit the present button here to allow this to look a little bigger. There we go. That's, that's more like it. So, as we'll see through these lectures, um, history does not consist of rote memorization of facts about the past, and those facts do not, quote, speak for themselves. Uh, further, a couple other things we need to think about is that history does not repeat itself nor can we draw lessons from these supposed repetitions. And it's also not true that history and memory are synonymous. They are, in fact, separate and often very antithetical to each other. Now, among the most uh, important realities of historical study is what historians sometimes call the law of unintended consequences. The fact that consequences of human actions often differ sharply from the motivations of those who acted. For, at Columbus, for example, wanted to find a western water route to the Indies, not discover America. And further, we often select facts to study in history on the basis of those unintended consequences. For example, even though Columbus was not the first European to discover the Americas, his explorations are far more important historically than those of, say, Leif Erikson, because of their enormous consequences. Now, with that said, let's take a look at this uh, religious toleration in colonial America. Now, to begin, let's talk about where uh, this... Uh, there you go. Where this myth of religious toleration in America began. Now, many people believe that tolerate, and this, if you read, the, we'll be reading from the top down if you're following along here. Now, many people believe that toleration arrived in um, North America with many English colonists who were seeking religious freedom, beginning with the Pilgrims in 1620, and proceeding through the establishment of all 13 colonies. Now, that's not the case. Many colonists, including Virginia, or colonies, excuse me, including Virginia and New York, uh, were founded for non-religious reasons. And even in colonies that were, were religiously founded, many colonists came for very non-religious reasons. Now, moreover, religious toleration was not considered a virtue at the time. Even a desire to escape from religious persecution in Europe usually did not lead to a belief in tolerance for others. And as a result, colonial history is filled with religious conflict and persecution. Puritans, for example, persecuted and banned virtually anyone who disagreed with them. Now, toleration did begin to develop during the colonial era, but only after gradually and largely accidental. For those who came to North America seeking religious freedom and an end to their persecution, religion was central to their belief system and worldview. Almost by definition, therefore, they could not conceive of another belief system as even valid. 
Now, indeed, the pilgrims who arrived in Plymouth in 1620 were not escaping religious persecution in England, but toleration in the Netherlands, where they had moved and where they feared their youth would be led astray. Now, the Puritans who arrived in Massachusetts Bay a decade later banished dissenters in their own Congregationalist denomination, such as Roger Williams and Anne Hutchinson as well as those from other denominations or religions and executed those who violated such banishment. Now, how could these be examples of religious toleration? Now, furthermore, religious warfare broke out in colonies that did not allow other denominations and religions. Maryland, for example, was founded by George Calvert, or Lord Baltimore, as a haven for persecuted Catholics but soon had a Protestant majority and a virtual civil war between the two. So obviously, it's difficult to argue that uh, there was toleration in the Americas, or that even the pilgrims and the, and the colonists arrived here merely uh, because they wanted to be more tolerant with their religion. Now, as we look at the development of toleration, Religious toleration was partially established by Puritan dissenters, most notably Roger Williams, who we saw in the last uh, section. Now, after he was banished from Massachusetts Bay, Williams founded Rhode Island and is known to us for his insistence on the separation of church and state, as well as his opposition to forced worship. Now, not well known is the fact that Williams wanted separation of church and state in hopes of maintaining the purity of the Puritan church against a corrupt state, not vice versa. And unlike the Puritans who sought to reform the corrupt Anglican church, Williams also wanted total separation from the church of England itself. Now equally unknown is the fact that in his continuing efforts to create a pure church and retain his own purity, Williams' separatism accelerated in Rhode Island until, quote, he could not conscientiously have communion with anyone but his wife. Now, at this point, he realized the error of his ways and admitted sinners into his church and all denominations to his colony. Now, Williams, in short, was a religious absolutist and purist who came to toleration only gradually and only by a series of what we would consider back doors. Now, toleration also resulted uh, from settlers more interested in profits than religion, particularly the Dutch in New Amsterdam. In the mid-1650s, these settlers even allowed the first Jewish community in what would eventually become New York. Now, another partial explanation for the development of toleration can be found in the negative example of the English Civil Wars during the 1640s, followed by the execution of the English king and the establishment of a Puritan dictatorship under Oliver Cromwell. This experience illustrated where both religious and political conflict could lead. Now, greater tolerance arose in England after the restoration of the monarchy in 1660. Now, it's also true that no one Christian denomination was dominant in all 13 colonies, which led many groups who feared persecution by others to support toleration as a means of protecting themselves, thus one step clo closer to actual colonial religious toleration. Now, Maryland's famous um, <clears throat> 1649 Act of Religious Toleration, for example, was approved by Calvert's son, Cecilius, uh, that's Lord Baltimore, uh, his son, Cecilius, to protect Catholics against a Protestant majority. But it was passed by a Protestant legislature to protect them against Calvert's Catholics. Now, finally, toleration was partially the result of the founding of a new colony in the 1640s, Pennsylvania, by a new and more tolerant denomination, William Penn's Quakers. Now, moving on to our next section here, our belief in the myth of toleration may be the result of a tendency to confuse colonial practice 
with the First Amendment to the Constitution, which banned any state-established religion and established legal toleration of all religions. But it's important to remember that that amendment passed in 1791 and should not be confused with events that occurred more than a century and a half earlier. Sometimes we often forget that for over 150 years, people almost over 200 years, people lived in the colonies prior to it actually becoming the United States of America. Furthermore, the First Amendment, um, excuse me, <clears throat> the First Amendment banned only Congress from establishing a state religion, that is, uh, the federal government, not the individual states. Now, only with the 14th Amendment in 1868, which we'll talk about towards the end of the course, and 20th century Supreme Court rulings, which you can learn about in History 102, was, was state-established religion completely prohibited. Now, even more anachronistic and incorrect than this projection of events from 1791 to 1833 onto the 1600s is a tendency to project our contemporary values onto the past in the, pre, in the process of attempting to discover the roots of those values. Now, the praise of Roger Williams serves as a classic example in this regard. He did indeed call for tolerance and the separation of church and state, but in the interests of protecting what he considered his true church from the corruption of the state. Now, further, the passage of the First Amendment in 1791 and the later disestablishment of Congregationalism in New England by no means resulted in religious toleration as we understand the term today. Toleration did not translate into social acceptance, and plenty of religious prejudice existed in the 19th through the 20th centuries, uh, as well as in the 17th and 18th century colonial history. For example, 18th anti-Catholicism, a deep prejudice in much of, the, of much of U.S. history, reached a peak of sorts with the anti-immigration and anti-Catholic know-nothing party of the 1850s, which fused religious and radical intolerance and almost eclipsed the newly founded Republican Party as the successor to the Whigs and the second major political party. Now, anti-Catholicism emerged and then re-emerged in the 19th century with the rise of the Ku Klux Klan and played a role in the defeat of the Catholic Al Smith in the presidential election of 1928. The 1920s also witnessed a major wave of anti-Semitism. Now, where does religious tolerance actually emerge? Now, religious tolerance has historical roots in early colonial history, but it didn't emerge in its modern form until the second half of the 20th century, primarily as a result of the Second World War. Hitler's racist ideas came from more than a century of European and American thinking and practice. However, in witnessing the hideous consequences of the literal implementation of those ideas, Americans finally began to question their religious and racial prejudices. Simultaneously defeating Hitler requ required placing more than 15 million Americans in uniform, many of whom saw and interacted with other Americans of different religions and races for the first time. Now the impact of this awakening on many Americans was profound and nearly immediate. In just a few years after the war, Major League Baseball was integrated. A film about anti-Semitism in America won the Oscar for Best Picture. Truman ordered the integration of the armed forces and supported recognition of the State of Israel, and the Supreme Court ordered integration of the public schools. Now, what we've said in this lecture exemplifies the broader approach that we will take throughout the course, specifically our skeptical approach will involve paying attention to the law of unintended consequences, the fact that the consequences of human actions often differ quite sharply from the motivations of those who acted. We must also be wary of an, uh, anachronistic thinking, that is, distorting the past by dealing with events and ideas out of their proper chronological order. 
context. And as we saw in this lecture, such thinking often takes the form of projecting contemporary values onto the past. Now, we'll further see how key words change meaning and significance over time. Religious tolerance once meant not killing one another and accepting that others might live in the same colony. Today, toleration tends to have a much broader meaning than it did in previous centuries. Finally, we see that history and memory are not the same. Our memory and ensuing commemoration of the origins of events and ideas often differ quite dramatically from historical realities. Now here's a couple things to think about. Why do we tend to equate the desire to escape religious persecution with a desire for religious freedom and tolerance? And why do we assume that 17th century Europeans do the same way about religion, feel the same way about religion that we do today? Now, after reading this and going through the lecture and doing some of the readings for this week's uh, work, uh, you should go back to the discussion forum and uh, take a look at some of the questions that are being asked and whether or not they are things that um, uh, have been taken out of historical context or things, or should we, should we be more skeptical about what's actually happening in history? And this ends uh, this lecture on religious toleration in the colonies, um, and this is Professor Hosselman with MJC History 101.